Hello everyone and welcome to uh, another short video presentation about working with the Web Audio API. This is one of several videos we're doing focused on the delay node and specifically today we're going to be talking about Vibrato and how to implement Vibrato using the delay node. So let's go. So a little bit of a recap, the delay node passes input audio, so any audio stream, to the output after some specified delay time. A very simple node in that sense, it just delays uh, whatever is connected to the input. An example of uh, creating such a node is just using new delay node uh, where you specify whatever the audio context is. In this case, we've defined an audio context called context, and you set the delay time. Delay time can be set on a separate line. Here it's set on this line. The delay time is given in seconds. So in this example, 0 0.005 or 0 0.005 corresponds to five milliseconds of delay. Delay is simple, but it has many uses and it's very powerful. In uh, another video where we first introduced delay, we talked about the cone filter and feedback delay. We'll also do another video on the car plus strong algorithm, which creates pluck string like sounds. So uh, like plucking a string on a guitar or a hammer hitting a piano key and um, using the delay node. But today, we're going to focus on vibrato. So, what is vibrato? It's defined as small, quasi-periodic variation in the pitch of a tone. It's a popular performance technique. Trumpet players use it, violinists use it, but it can also be added to any signal as an audio effect. So, input audio comes into some effect or uh, a plugin, and output audio is um, that same signal with vibrato applied. The quasi-periodic nature means that it's generally sinusoidal or close to sinusoidal variation. In real-world performance, um, no one is able to add vibrato exactly as a pure sinusoid, but there's an attempt to get uh, such periodic behavior. Also, it's fa fairly small variation. You don't have the frequency vary from its real value, from its actual value, all the way down to zero hertz, but you vary it around that main value. It has several parameters that um, are typically used. The type of variation, we're not going to really address that today, but it's very often sinusoidal, but it could be other uh, periodic oscillators like square waves, triangle waves, sawtooth waves, or uh, a random element, even a random walk can be added in there to uh, simulate or emulate the quasi-periodic behavior. It has a low frequency oscillator or LFO, which is slowly varying the signal. So that is the um, oscillator that varies. And that oscillator has a particular frequency which determines how often the pitch changes from a minimum to a maximum value, varying around the value it would have without any vibrato applied. And the width, sometimes known as the depth, which is the total amount of pitch variation. Does it just vary one hertz, very small variation, or does it vary um, essentially from nothing all the way up to uh, two times what the frequency would have been or even more. So how does it usually work? There's a lot of different ways to implement vibrato, but one common technique is somehow changing the playback speed of the sampled audio. So if you play sound uh, at a faster rate, then essentially it goes through the samples in one period quicker. And that means that uh, from one maximum value to the next maximum value, or from one period to the next period, uh, takes less time. And so it's a higher pitch rather than uh, 10 cycles in a second for 10 hertz. 
If you go through those uh, periods quicker, you have 11 uh, cycles in a second or more, and so you're increasing the pitch. Uh, if you um, play the sound slower, it's the opposite. It takes a longer period of time to get through one period, so that period um, is longer in terms of seconds or milliseconds, hence the frequency is lower, and so you lower the pitch if you play it slower. So one could change the playback rate on a, um, on a file or on a sample or audio stored in the buffer, in which case you're modifying um, parameters of the buffer node or modifying uh, the playback rate of a media element but we would like more control. We would like to be able to change the playback rate of something that isn't in a, in a buffer or isn't part of a media element. Maybe we want to, change, to add vibrato to the sum of different things in our audiograph, within the audio context that we create. For that, we will add vibrato through the use of modulated delay lines. And what does that mean? A modulated delay line is a delay line whose delay length is varied. It changes over time. In the other examples, we generally thought of the delay uh, time being fixed. Uh, we had a control where we might be able to vary it, but essentially the core behavior comes from uh, a single value of the delay. Well, here we want to introduce a pitch shift. And delay alone, without changing it, does not introduce a pitch shift. If we delay a signal by a constant amount, every sample is delayed by a constant sample, by, sorry, by a constant amount. And what that would mean if we don't change it is we just get back a delayed version of the original. Now suppose instead that the, the delay decreases each sample by a constant amount. So we're delaying the signal by a certain amount, and then the next sample it's a bit less, next sample a bit less, and that. So less samples will be, need to be played out in order to complete one period of a periodic waveform. Hence, the periodic waveform will appear shorter because the delay is decreasing higher frequency. Uh, the same idea applies if the length of the delay line increases each sample, then to go through one period, it's not just that all of the samples are delayed, but the delay is increasing. And so to go through one period will take longer, hence lowering the frequency. What this means is that the actual amount of pitch shift depends not on, the, on a fixed delay value, but on the derivative of the delay, how delay changes over time. And there's a nice formula, it's easily derived, which is if we have uh, an oscillator, a sine wave, a pure tone, any um, frequency component within a signal, and we are modulating the delay with some delay that is time dependent, call it m of t, then the new frequency for this component is given by the initial frequency, here it's fc, times 1, as, um, as it would be ordinarily, minus the time derivative of this time varying delay. And that's right here. So just a tiny bit more on the math and the theory before we can dive into implementation. So let's get that pitch shift. Consider um, a sine wave. It could be a frequency component of a richer signal going in as the audio stream at the input, apply some time varying delay, m of t, and so we'll write this down, it's a low frequency oscillator, um, ah, yes, um, we apply that m of t to the sine wave given before, so it becomes sine of 2 pi uh, fc for the frequency of the sine wave, and instead of times t for time, it's t plus m of t, the modulation. Given the formula on the previous slide uh, and repeated here, 
then if we apply a low frequency oscillator, so given right here, and I'll talk through that in a second, we're going to take the time derivative of that for the formula given to arrive at a new frequency. So how do we construct the modulation? The modulation needs to have some default delay applied, and that makes sure that we don't have a delay that reads into the future. So that um, T plus M of T is always looking at current or past samples. If M is um, negative, we might actually be trying to read negative time, signal that hasn't occurred yet. So we have this M average to apply an average uh, delay. We have W, which is the width or the depth. How much uh, variation in the pitch are we trying to achieve there? And our new frequency is just the derivative, uh, um, or it just comes from this formula involving the derivative. So we take the derivative of the modulation, and that's what it is. And so there are three main parameters here. Uh, the average delay, which is not very important, it just needs to be picked. The width or the depth, how much modulation and how quickly the variation happens, the frequency of the low frequency oscillator. This is usually chosen quite small, so below 10 hertz. So, we now know how to calculate the pitch shift. We know what we're trying to implement. Let's look at the code. This is on the uh, left, as I'm looking at it, bottom left, is a block diagram, the audio graph, what's going to happen. For any source, we apply a delay, and the delayed version of that source goes to the destination. But the delay time is varied using a low frequency oscillator. So the idea is we connect a low frequency oscillator to a gain node, the gain node itself gives the depth. We connect this gain node here to the delay time parameter of the delay. So this modulates the delay, varies the delay time that is being applied. When we do that connection, it adds with the intrinsic value of the delay time. And whatever we have set as the default delay time or the intrinsic value is then our average delay. So here's the code. Um, first, we have the HTML. There's two parameters that are important here, the depth and the frequency of the low frequency oscillator. We're assuming that the type of oscillator is always going to be a sinusoid. Then we have the JavaScript code. First, we create an audio context. Then at our source, we're going to read it from a media element. And then we create a delay node. We set it to a delay time of one. One second, it means no matter, we would need a very, very large um, variation in the delay in order to exceed that. And just to give us a large buffer, we only need one up to uh, whatever is our maximum. But so we'll set that to 10. 10 seconds are um, stored in the buffer there. We'll never need it, but we picked a big value. We have um, the LFO gain, which we've initially set to zero. And so that's the gain in this gain node. And the LFO itself is an oscillator, which we've set to a frequency of five hertz. Start the oscillator connect the source to the um, delay. The source, by the way, is, uh, lost that for a second. The source, by the way, is an audio sample of a trumpet playing. So we connect that source to the delay, and then we connect the LFO to the LFO gain, and we connect that gain to the delay time parameter of the delay. And finally, connect the delay to the destination. We also allow the um, parameters to be changed. So there's a callback here for both 
the vibrato depth and frequency, it goes to this update function. If either of them is changed, we just update the value of the LFO frequency and we update the LFO gain. Now here, we take the depth value on the interface and divide it by 2 pi times the LFO frequency. And why do we do that? Well, let's look at the formula on the previous slide again. The variation in frequency is determined by this width or depth times 2 pi times the LFO frequency. So if we want the parameter on the interface to correspond with this overall depth, we divide the parameter by 2 pi um, times the frequency of the LFO, so that then we're able to see that the depth that's given on the interface actually corresponds directly with this overall variation, this overall depth here. Okay, so let's have a look this is the, the code right here. I'm going to remove this console log there. I was doing that purely to test the code as I was implementing it. And let's try this. Hopefully you will all hear it okay, but I know it can be problematic. I will start off with a vibrato depth set to zero, vibrato frequency set to zero. So essentially we're applying no vibrato in the beginning. And then I will uh, vary those parameters. Increase the depth, so more and more frequency um, uh, variation, and increase the speed at which we're varying that frequency here. And that is vibrato. So it's an interesting effect, but there's lots of other effects such as the flanger, which are created in similar ways. Have a delay and modulate that delay with an LFO. So uh, as always, if you have any questions, please get in touch. That is the end of today's uh, video. And thank you very much.